Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm David Hazan, the creator and writer of Nottingham, Tales from Nottingham, Monomyth, and Death Drop Drag Assassin. You can find me at Twitter and Instagram at David T. Hazan and on my website at www.davidhazan.com. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a man that has lived in the future because of the time zone difference. And we are joined by a very talented comic creator and, and writer. He is the creator of Death Drag Drop Assassin, Mono Myth, and of course, Nottingham. The ever talented David T. Hazan. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. <laughs> it's 5 a.m. So um, the caffeine in injection <laughs> that I just took via energy drink is working quite well. I love it. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I am a comic book writer, clearly uh, based in Melbourne, Australia. I am the writer and creator of Nottingham. That's how most people know me anyway, uh, from Mad Cave Studios, uh, which is a medieval noir starring the sheriff of Nottingham hunting a serial killer. At least that's where it starts anyway. I'm bringing a bunch of new comics to the market this year, including Tales from Nottingham, which is a spin-off anthology, uh, which takes a bunch of different Mad Cave Studios talent search creators from 2021, throws them in together and gets them to tell stories about the main characters in Nottingham, Monomyth, which is coming out later this year, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and also Death Drop Drag Assassin. So what is it about writing comics? Does it energize you or does it drain you creatively? Uh, we're going in hard <laughs> uh, already. Uh, that's a complicated question. Yeah, both is is more accurate. Sometimes the work is so personal, and it has been lately uh, with things both announced and unannounced that it does kind of drain you. But that's how you know you're or like you're onto something good. But it also it also is energizing, and that's kind of how this all started. Was I really was struggling to write novels. Someone uh, kind of encouraged me to try my hand at comics, and I just found it surprisingly easy to get it from my head onto the page, and it all just kind of fit in like a puzzle. And I was like, oh, I should have been doing this a long time ago. <laughs> You have uh, three things you need to talk about here today. We'll start off with, obviously, your two newer series here as well, too, because they were rather interesting to read. I got through a couple of the issues there. I didn't have enough time to go through all of them, which just means I have to read more tonight and see what else you're coming with in the future as well, too, because you piqued my interest there. But tell us the synopsis about Death Drop Drag Assassin, and then we'll jump into the same for Mono Myth as well. So uh, Death Drop is the story of an ex-hitman turned drag queen who is kind of encouraged to try to solve a rash of recent disappearances and deaths that have been haunting her city's queer districts. And the more she delves into it, the more questions she has, but also the more she feels the specter of her assassin mentor haunting her every step. Mysterious. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, we're deep on the mysteries this year. <laughs> <laughs> this was kind of a revamp of the first comic that I ever wrote. So it's near and dear to my heart, which sometimes <laughs> means that, you know, you end up creatively drained at the end of it. But I really wanted to write the kind of queer comics that I wanted to read. And that was kind of my starting point for how I wanted to get to get Death Drop to readers. Then why is Death Drop? Drag Assassin, an important story for you to tell, though. I wanted to tell a story that was... Death Drop is kind of, in part, a superhero story. It borrows a lot of that stuff. I kind of took Jessica Jones and drag queens and 
put that all together. I wanted to write a superhero, drag superhero story, a queer superhero story that wasn't about punching homophobes. You know, those stories have their place. They have fantastic creators working on them right now, in the future, in the past. That really wasn't the kind of thing that I was, you know, interested in reading all the time. And so this one is more about internalized homophobia and really the kinds of damage that queer people do to each other rather than the damage that comes from external to our community. And we interrogate really how that external pressure creates that internal pressure and also primarily the healing power of drag to kind of subvert the kind of cycles that lead to uh, internalized homophobia. But talk about Monomyth. What is that comic all about? Well, Monomyth came about from Mad Cave uh, coming to me and wanting something that was a little bit battle royale And I was like, okay, well, what is different from anything that has been done in that genre before. And so what I came up with is Monomyth, which is about the last sort of ailing wizard casting a final spell, and he summons the descendants of a bunch of ancient bloodlines of magic to his castle. But when they get there, they find that it's not this sort of enchanting, wondrous experience instead it's a terrifying sore like hunger games like battle to see who will inherit the wizard's power i mean battle royale was just a classic not only was it a classic in film format when i saw the original one itself because that was just a you know, a mind-blowing piece of cinema out of japan there uh, itself but reading the actual manga ba it was based off of it was yeah. just just way out there like it was amazing <laughs> opinion <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I look i think the the reality is sometimes things are so good that people want to riff on them and riff on them and riff on them and i was just like oh well what if i riffed on it in a way that was completely different and riffed on something else as well to anyone who was listening carefully there's a little you know there's a little bit of harry potter a little bit of the magicians in there a little bit of you know arthur and merlin in there um and I've kind of thrown all these ingredients together, hopefully, to create something new. But <laughs> we'll leave that up to you, dear reader. <laughs> What's the most misunderstood aspect about the mystery or the supernatural genre that people who don't follow them misunderstand? It would be easy to say, uh, I guess, the role of magic in the story, because really, Monomyth is all about the role of magic in the story because it's a world where uh, magic and stories are one in this. And I think that it's hard for me to articulate how without spoiling too much. <laughs> the more you delve into Monomyth, the more you realize that the magic that people are capable of in that world is inextricably tied to the reach of each of their stories, to the potential of each of their stories. So then what about the mystery genre for, say, Death Drop? What's misunderstood about that genre? Hmm. I think the, the, the thing about um, the mystery genre is it's so evergreen, it's hard for people to find something new. And so the something new doesn't necessarily come from the mystery itself but it comes from the protagonist and the perspective. Everybody loves Columbo and everybody loves Jessica Jones and they're similar and the same in some places and wildly different in other places. And it's not about the mysteries that surround them. It's about how they interact with them. That makes them special, I guess. Have you ever felt creatively stifled when it comes to the stories that you create or when you're working with other people? I feel like in t I've sometimes creatively stifled myself. I find most of the time that working with other people is actually creatively energizing. And let's say, for example, you have an artist whose style you didn't envisage on the book. Somebody else clearly envisaged it, but you didn't. And that's okay, because that's a new set of constraints to work with and a new paradigm that might breed new creativity, you know? But I've never really felt creatively stifled other than by my own <laughs> by, by my own brain not letting me write. That's, that's most of where the stifling comes from. <laughs> <laughs> we get in our own ways a lot of times, right? Oh, a lot of the time. Writer's block is a huge 
problem for me and I'm lucky enough to be working on a lot of things all at once, which is beneficial in that if I get stuck with one thing, I try moving to the other one or another one and see if that uh, <laughs> kind of resolves the issue. You mentioned working with a collaboration and working with the team itself here as well. So all of my Mad Cave stuff is with the, the team at Mad Cave. Nottingham is illustrated by Shane Connery Volk, including my issue of Tales from Nottingham. Uh, Mono Myth is illustrated by the lovely Cecilia Lovalvo and uh, colored by the incredible Marissa Louise. Nottingham is colored by uh, Luca Romano. And Death Drop Drag Assassin is both illustrated and colored by the incredible uh, Alex Moore. Honestly, the creative teams I've been blessed with, I would say they've been really unique fantastic collaborations in their own right. I've gotten to a point where, you know, I just throw stuff at Shane and he just delivers every single time. I don't really have to delve too deeply into what he's doing. And he just takes things and runs with them in a way that's absolutely delightful. Alex just throws a bunch of ideas at me. They're constantly communicating, trying to interrogate what's in my head from what's on the script and that's not to say that <laughs> the script it doesn't have all the detail there but they're really trying to be like all right well how do i innovate with every single page and every single spread and it's just it's glorious to watch their style is so different from for example shane's and then cecilia is just you know it's, it's hard to really describe it's just all uh, all scratchy ink all everywhere and it's a you know it's a little a bit of chaos and but at the end of the day you throw a splash page at her and she will give you something that is jaw dropping and all of her characters are so expressive it's fantastic i, I just i don't have enough bad things to say because i don't have any bad things to say <laughs> i enjoy working with all of these people they're all very different and all very lovely and all very collaborative and fantastic storytellers i'm not gonna try to put you on the spot with this next question but <laughs> what was a what was a piece of artwork you got back from both of these or all of these creative people when you handed them the script and you got their artwork back what was better in art form than what you had on the page uh, every single page <laughs> Uh, I, it's it's you know I I'm always mystified by the by the thing that goes on in artists' heads where they take you know a sentence that I've written and turn it into a full page of artwork. That it's just to me that is the best part of the process. Just once you've finished a script and gone through the ordeal, uh, especially if it's something that's uniquely personal, of getting all of that out on the page and then having someone go, this is what that looks like to me, <laughs> and it being just 11 times better than wh what you could have even possibly imagined is really thrilling. And it happens with Shane every single time, uh, you know, it happens with <laughs> Cecilia and Alex every single time. So I try uh, as much as possible not to get in their way. And there'll be like small details sometimes where like, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? But I'll never try to change the nature of what they're trying to do. It'll just be details. So World building, character names, color theory, everything that goes into the comics that you've, you've created here with your amazing teams in both Scout Comics and uh, Mad Cave as well. You know, it's just amazing what a collaboration, when everyone's on the same page working together to put together what you've created. It, the end result has to be amazing once you finally get it in your hands and you get feedback from, say, the fans that get to read this stuff. How has the feedback been from those that have gotten to read these works? Wildly positive. That's a thing that no matter how long I've doing this, uh, it's still well, at least for now, it still surprises me. No fans really or reviewers have seen Death Drop yet. We're hoping to change that pretty soon because that comes out in June. Monomyth, which comes out in May, we've had a few reviews trickle in that have been really great. And I've been very tentative about that one, mostly because there's a lot of ground to cover. It's six issues, and the first issue doesn't necessarily, like, it leaves a lot of threads to pull on. People have still responded incredibly positively to it, which I, you know, it's, it's very gratifying. And then Nottingham, you know, 
between the first issue of the main series and the first issue of Tales from Nottingham, both sold out. It's a wild experience every single time. And we did have it a lot of times with that first arc, you know. Every issue except for the final issue sold out because the demand seemed to just expand wildly. We went to five printings on the first issue or something stupid. A big thank you from me um, and the rest of the creative team for that one. Because that really was like, okay, we're we're on we're on the money here. Part of it uh, is that you never really know because you're so siloed as a creative person until the work is out there, whether or not people will receive it well. You can try to speculate. You can try to, you know, angle your approach to something that you think people would like. But at the end of the day, you have no clue until that thing hits the shelves whether or not people will like it. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oof. Really, uh, really hammering on the nostalgia there. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to answer this question. <laughs> this is not a 5 a.m. question, Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you uh, about the kind of the comic that got me into comics then. Batwoman Elegy um, was the book that kind of set me tumbling down the rabbit hole, um, no pun intended, <laughs> of comics. And I was very much a latecomer to comics. I was always interested in, I guess, comics-related media. But it wasn't until some colleagues of mine got the shits with me <laughs> talking about comic book-related media without actually having read the source material that they kind of shoved books in my hands. And the first one they shoved in my hands was Batwoman Elegy. And... I think there was a unique power in that story. It was both in art and writing, uniquely paired, uniquely queer, both in the written text and also in this kind of unwritten Alice in wonderland sort of way. And she was also Jewish, and I was like, what is going on here? And the reality is you can do things in comics that you could just never do in any other media. I guess that was when I noticed the unique storytelling power of comics, that not just the written word, but also the written word intertwined with art, as it were. <laughs> In this book, it was just, you know, it was almost revelatory experience. And that sent me down the, well, if people are doing this and it's this good, I want to do it. Six months later, I won the Mad Cave Talent Search, which led to Nottingham and all of the things that have followed. So very thankful for that book. <laughs> and for those two colleagues who are at their wits end. <laughs> <laughs> is there a comic that made you feel the way you hope readers of your work will feel after reading it? Oh, so many. For starters, obviously, Batwoman Elegy. The Savage Shores is one that I was like, oh, 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 oh wow. Anything Tom King does it for me as well. And I'm like, I, I get that with a lot of these books. I get that feeling almost creative dread going, well, how can I get to be this good? is usually my my next question. Alan Moore gives you the answer. If you ever get the chance to have a look at his BBC Maestro course, he gives you the answer, which is that trying to ape the books that you love will not make you a good writer. You'll just be doing the same things that other people are doing and worse. Trying to do better with the things that you see that you don't like, but that you see the seed of a great story in can make you successful. I feel like my stuff really takes those words and lives by them between Nottingham, which is me seeing a lot of Robin Hood related media and going, why is this so crap? How do we, <laughs> you know, anyone who saw the latest Taron Edgerton movie will agree with me. The question, and we try to answer that question doing it in a way that isn't creatively bankrupt, hopefully. <laughs> Death Drop, to an extent the same. I was reading the kinds of, you know, queer superhero media, not that I was, like, excited by, and that's because once you read The Pride, how do you go anywhere from there? And I'm sure a lot of people have, and I've read of some that, like, innovate. I want to really push the boundaries of what we were trying to do with Death Drop. Monomyth is... To an extent, it's my feelings about how She Who Must Not Be Named betrayed a generation of fans out there on the page. And, you know, I'm not really pushing an agenda there. I'm just trying to pause how I'm feeling about that 
through making something new. So <laughs> hopefully you get that the media itself was fine. Sometimes I feel like it was generated by a marketing machine. At least once the movies came out, it really became propelled by the marketing rather than by the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. by the story. And I'm sure I'm going to get people's hackles raised for this, but <laughs> I'm prepared to do that. I think, she does a whole lot of getting people's hackles raised for no reason. So I feel like, you know, spruiking my book is a good reason to get people a little frustrated. But read the book, see what you think before you, you know, add me on Twitter or whatever. <laughs> Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Uh, oof. The projects that you shelve are just as important as the projects that you push push forward with, and knowing how to choose between the two will inevitably propel your career forward. Look, sometimes you pitch something, it doesn't work, you you know, the creative team just isn't gelling, or the reason why the pitch doesn't work has something to do with the pitch itself and not necessarily with the way you've pitched it to and being able to interrogate what went wrong and why and being able to then go okay well maybe i can put this aside and being comfortable with putting uh, your baby that you've created aside will inevitably only benefit you the idea that you know everything you write must see the light of day is not it's not realistic it's actually doing you a disservice sometimes. But sometimes, though, it's the, the maybe the, the story doesn't get written, but maybe a concept from that story makes it into something you actually resolve. Absolutely. I've borrowed, I've borrowed from my own stuff before. You know, I put Death Drop on the shelf for years before I picked it up again. Really, I've been working on this since probably 20, 2018 at least. Sometimes it's a matter of not just knowing when to sh put it on the shelf, but when to bring it back off the shelf. Yeah, that would be the piece of advice is that no creative baby is so sacred that you can't put it away for a little while and come back to it later. Going back to the collaboration question, because we have three comics here, obviously we touched on just two of them, but what about the collaborators for Tales of Nottingham? Because you said that was more of a collective of people, if I recall. Yeah, so uh, Tales from Nottingham a structured as an anthology, but each single issue is a one-shot tale, be it a mystery or otherwise, set in the world of Nottingham. And as a former Talent Search winner, Mad Cave came to me and said, we want our Talent Search 2021 winners to do Nottingham stories. And I said, okay, but I don't want to mess up what I'm trying to do in the future. So bring me on as a you know editorial consultant, a story consultant for the entire run, I'll write and Shane will draw an issue. You know, I can use it as a way to give back to the new crop of talent search winners. And they were all so brilliant and lovely and dedicated to making the most out of the story and out of the seeds of the story that I gave them. And it was really fantastic to watch them, you know, bring their own unique perspective, bring that to the world of Nottingham and try to fit that as a puzzle piece inside the world of Nottingham. They've been doing it brilliantly so far. We'll continue to do it over the next few months. Issue one sold out and is going to a second printing and that's me and Shane. Issue two is because there were so many people on this book, sometimes it's hard to keep track of names, but I know who they all are <laughs> before somebody. <laughs> Anna Everts and Gabriel Sarah did a uh, little tale, which included some fun European folklore in a tonally Nottingham, very bloody and gruesome way. On April 26th, we have Sabs Cooper and Federico Bertoni. And this one I'm really excited about because they got to do the Maid Marian origin story. And it is complex and brutal and interesting as exactly as I hope the Marion uh, story would turn out. Then in May, we have a Friar Tuck story from Dylan Essex and Miguel Puerta, followed by, in June, Damien Becton and Raphael Romeo Magat doing the Robin origin story. And then finally, parts of this have been announced, parts of it haven't, but I'm just going to come out and say it because 
I don't think I'll get in trouble for it. And if I do, oh, well, <laughs> you get a little exclusive. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the final issue of Tales from Nottingham is a prequel to Volume 3, which is coming out next year of the main series, of the main Nottingham series. And it is written by Mags Visaggio and illustrated by Victor Santos of Polar. I have seen the pages and they're fantastic and I can't wait for you all to see them. It's so thrilling getting to see people really reinterpret your vision, put one foot in trying to st stay true to your vision and one foot in, you know, bringing their own creativity to the equation. And it's just, it's so much fun. I couldn't be happier with how this turned out. And I'm sure the art styles are, are definitely different than what your what the original series has. And it's just, like you said, it's their takes on, on this beautiful world that you've created. And it's these types of collaborations that maybe these artists will be on future projects of your own main stories. They will. That has already happened. It's yet to be announced. But one of these artists is working on something. It's not huge, but it is something that you'll find out probably in the next few months. And it's a really thrilling idea. It's been lovely to do that. And also just to watch as these books get announced go up on previews. I feel like a proud mom, you know, with my little talent search babies. And I know that that's kind of weird and like pejorative way to put it and that but like seeing them succeed makes me so happy and seeing them start to see reviews of their work have it be overwhelmingly positive is just it's it makes me you know it makes me very happy and makes me feel like I've done a good job as a writer as a story consultant and as a mentor I don't mean that I like I was ever trying to interpose myself above them. Pretty cool and pretty gratifying to see the next raft of talent search creators who I've worked with on building these stories directly really succeed. And they're all doing their own things and uh, as well and succeeding in those as well. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? You really do go for the... I, I, I keep being surprised by how introspective these are. I really shouldn't be by this point. I'm going to blame it on... I'm going to blame it on the early, early morning brain. <laughs> God, there, is, there are too many people. To be frank, I would say those lovely colleagues, um, some of whom have written comics themselves, some of them who have been amazing artists, both of them are fantastic lawyers <laughs> i don't know how relevant your readers will find that tim perry and shanri tan both pretty fantastically creative people in their own right i've talked about this a little bit on twitter none of this comic book thing would exist without their encouragement without them not only shoving copies of things in my hands but also encouraging me along the way in this process and and guiding me it's like what podcasts to listen to, for example, and which creators to follow, what to read next. I was able to go from zero to 100 with comics fairly quickly. Their own creativity is also what inspired this. The answer is my lovely colleagues from the day job who have uh, and continue to inspire me. From a professional standpoint, you've created three amazing comics and four technically with, of course, Nottingham and then Tales of Nottingham. But you have many more in the future, which means that we'll have to have you back on in the future to talk about these amazing series that you have coming down the pipe. So I can't wait to talk with you there. So mm -hmm. you've been signed also to Scout Comics and, and Mad Cave as well. So you are professionally successful on, on many different fronts. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Hmm. Uh, it depends what the what the metric is. In a sense, yes. I would say I've kind of succeeded at breaking into comics. Now that I'm here, I feel like the next my next rung of success is to try to be able to make myself sufficient entirely on writing. I wouldn't say entirely on comics because, you know, that's only realistic for a very small subset of people. And that's not to say it's not achievable, but... You know, I, w I would like to really make writing my main job, the main gig. That's kind of the next rung of success I'm aiming for. But yeah, you know, I like three series in with more on the way. I Let's call it, let's call it four with more on the way. I, yeah, I feel like I've kicked the door down and now I've got to start, you know, walking into the room. Is <laughs> how I would put it. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Sometimes you just need 
a bit of distance from whatever it is, be that putting it back on the shelf for a while or putting it back on the shelf forever or where, you know, I, I hit writer's block, it's time to switch what I'm doing. And so sometimes the failure hurts in the context that it's in. And if you kind of give yourself some perspective, either mentally or just by letting time run and artificially kind of giving yourself some distance, nothing is that bad that it's, you know, that it's worth wallowing in, in terms of at least creative uh, failures. But I'm currently going through this whole, uh, like many uh, other people, this whole aftershock debacle. Failures are the nature of a creative industry. And hopefully, you know, that writes itself in the future, but you never know. And you've got to keep making all these other books. So just subsist on that instead. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or a creative person in some way, shape or form, maybe you've inspired them based off of your amazing talent uh, and work that you've already created. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oof. Um, I think it's just make good work, make work that you would want to read and hope that, you know, the next generation, at least in part, feels the same as you. Thinking about, you know, generations and generations of comic book readers that are getting brought up on Morrison and more and things that have, uh, you know, that reach pretty far backwards as far as the history of this medium is concerned, which is interesting to think about, given that you know these stories are so evergreen but the reality is as long as you make good work and make work that is important to you hopefully it'll be you know hopefully it in it'll inspire the next the next person i don't think inspiring the next person should ever be the focus it should be making stuff that inspires you and hopefully it inspires someone else as well Last question is a fun question because you can't be all introspective in this entire interview. And <laughs> I'm sure your monster drink is running out by now. So if your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, God. <laughs> this, no, the monster has definitely run out. Um, <laughs> that's the title. The monster has definitely run out. Ah. <laughs> uh, as for the soundtrack, I have no clue. Um, you've completely stumped me there. Most of my most of my musical listening goes to like movie soundtracks because um, uh, I why well, I usually listen to music while I write, and if there are words in it, um, it's all it's game over. Um, I just start writing lyrics instead of writing words on the page. Um, oh God. Yeah, I I I'm blanked on completely blanked on on the soundtrack, but I feel like, you know, the monster has really run out is such a good title. <laughs> well, here I'll I'll do the foreword for that book if you ever decide to write it. How about that? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I met I met David one early morning at 5 a.m. Australia time. I asked him a bunch of introspective questions that he completely blanked on. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that, like me, like sweating uh, and trying to come up with an answer to all of this uh, is entertaining, at least. <laughs> the story of a man completely and totally put on the spot. Um, <laughs> that's the subtitle. <laughs> You've survived. Let's start off with that. You survived the interview, so thank you so much for that, because this interview is un unfortunately over. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where can we find your amazing comics and uh, how else can we support you in the center? So uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at David T. Hazan, um, or uh, you can find me on my website at uh, DavidHazan.com. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, TGTmedia.com or TwoGeeksTalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our website is being revamped and updated. So go to the YouTube channel. Look at the thousand plus interviews there on YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash 
TGT Media. The podcast is back, which is at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or search for Two Geeks Talking on any of your audio streaming services. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.